Hello and welcome to today's episode of The Fintech Show. Now, in this episode, we're going to be looking at what insights can be gained from new data accessibility. In this industry, we are seeing money laundering fines, scams, chargebacks, and when payments travel at real-time speeds, how can compliance officers cope? Payments technology and culture have outstripped what has previously been thought as possible. How can the banks comply with the increasingly inventive regulators? Will the banks who didn't even get their data in order in the last decade survive this one? But am I actually asking the right questions? What are the end consumer benefits for this enhanced data reporting? Should we be looking at this in a positive light and realizing this is just where the industry is going? So to find out more, we've spoken to experts from the entire financial services ecosystem to tell us about this evolving landscape. And they're gonna give us the exciting lowdown on some of the most exciting use cases for both retail and commercial customers and what we can expect from payments in the future. First up, we travel to Amsterdam to meet André Gasterman from Intix over at Cybos, and that is a must-attend event for anyone in the payment space, so we were glad to catch André for just a moment of his time, because Intix makes transaction data actionable in real time, so I knew we needed him on today's episode. Now back over in the FF News South London branch, we caught Matt Cox from Nationwide Building Society, and he's the director of digital and card payments. So he was perfectly placed to explain how customer demands are changing from what they want from their payments and their data. Now, in a few moments, the director of FF News, Ali Patterson, is going to be joining us right here in the East London branch of FF News, and he's going to be interviewing Priya Sharma, the head of client connectivity and data over at Clearstream. So, without further ado, let's begin. Yeah, we know regulation is, is not a new topic, but what is really new in that space is that the regulators, in my view, are really becoming innovative. Basically, they are uh, uh, in creating new uh, reporting requirements that are more and more complex for, for banks to handle. And we have said years ago, certainly on the Intex side, that banks need to get their data in order, their transaction data, because this is the data they need to feed regulators on specific transactions. But this is where the complexity lies. More and more regulators understand there are other data sets that uh, are uh, quite interesting for them to, to know about or to filter on. So the, the way the banks need to report transactions is becoming more complex because indeed the, the regulators want more information or more specific types of transactions to report on. And, and this filter is quite complex to, to implement for banks. And also they want uh, faster reporting. So it's not like an end of month reporting as uh, we had a few years ago, but potentially a decade ago, but it's now on a continuous basis that this reporting has to uh, be performed. So basically our message of a few years ago for banks to get their data in order, in order to prepare for this regulatory wave is definitely still relevant. But now we see the complexity is increasing in terms of indeed the, the types of reports, the, the speed of reporting, the, the richness of transaction, and that's where indeed the more technology is, is required to automate all of this. Suddenly have a, a burden of regulatory compliance that an, has led to this enhanced data set? Um, y yes and no. I don't think it's cause and effect. Mm. Um, so if, if we if we step back and look at what's happened in the regulatory agenda over the last five years, um, you know, that that has been huge and transformational. I mean, the amount of regulation in payments, particularly over the last five years, has been probably more than the, I, I guess, 20 years that's preceded it. So, you know, Imagine. what have we seen? What have we seen flow through? We've had the open banking agenda led by the CMA order, which is overlapped and uh, and, and led ahead of um, PSD2, which required us all to open up um, yeah, what we call dedicated interfaces via APIs mm -hmm. so that third parties can, can access data and services um, directly from us as organizations. You've seen strong customer authentication come into force both across all the channels that we provide and for shopping online, which has sort of mm -hmm. ended in the um, industry ramp up for shopping online this year. Yeah. We've also seen confirmation of payee um, to try to sort of combat the increasing um, fraud epidemic that we've seen in the UK. And, and so, so generally, the, the regulatory agenda over the last five years has been huge. That, that alone, though, um, 
it isn't necessarily what's created the opportunity you know changes in technology um, and what's possible have also contributed to to that and changes in the demographic of consumers mm. the huge shift between um, you know face-to-face branch-based financial services and contact center based financial services through to um, digital and online um, access you know that that trend was happening anyway and then what the pandemic did was accelerate those trends probably bringing forward the future by another five to ten years in, in, in accelerating them in the process and so the sort of confluence of all of those uh, macro trends is really what's led to this situation today let's look from a top-down perspective how is data being used and how is it evolving in the in the post trade industry sure so uh data is truly becoming a new asset class now uh, with the use of advanced analytics and newer technologies major players are beginning to create a clearer view of their own data landscape uh, well there is increased focus on proactive and predictive client solutions uh, with amplify, amplified requirements around data quality and governance. Uh, it is projected that in the next three years, 44% of the data will be created by analytics and AI. 30% will be real time. Also by 2025, there'll be around 11 million data professionals in Europe alone. So through data and connectivity, organizations are beginning to identify opportunities for collaboration with clients, counterparties, other market players to support new business growth. You know, there are obvious use cases that where you want to choose to share all of your financial data with um, software and accounting firms and packages. And I think that's been hugely helpful um, for, for, for that part of the, um, the sector. You know, I'll, I'll talk primarily around retail because I think that's where nationwide building society needs to focus its time and attention well it is where we need to focus the time and attention on our members um you know for our members now ha has it yet been transformative no um there are some really good emerging use cases um that i think our members are starting to benefit from and that is about moving money using bank to bank payments via um, apis and we can increasingly see our members starting to use this capability um we can see our members starting to use these services for improved credit assessment, for example. So, uh, and in particular, I think we'll see more and more of this as we go into the cost of living squeeze. Yeah, so d definitely the end users, whether they are retail clients, corporate clients, enjoy um, the, the, the faster payments. Because, of course, if you're expecting a payment and you don't have to wait a few days or, or face glitches, as we know, happen on some particular international routes uh, through correspondent banks, and Swift GPI has helped this. But definitely, the move to real-time payments is is a benefit for for everyone. Huge investment on the bank side, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, benefiting everyone. Now, what the the client reaction has been, because everything is moving real time, is that they also want uh, easy access to this transaction data from the portal, from the bank portal, which could be on. A, on a mobile uh, device or on, on the laptop. And uh, this, the same need for accessing the transaction details, for navigating through data, running reports, is actually not only what internal teams within uh, banks uh, expect, for the, all the compliance requirements we discussed, but also the external clients. And we see more and more uh, banks offering not only uh, batch reporting to their clients, but real-time access to the latest transaction details and the processing status that uh, goes um, uh, goes with it. So it's all about connecting the front-end portals with the back, if, back office uh, uh, systems that are processing these systems. And this is all also where transaction data, as, as Intix offers, uh, enables to basically connect the, the, two, uh, the two environments, technology environments. What are the opportunities for compliance officers at banks? So basically, once the, the data is accessible, the compliance officers uh, really can navigate to indeed run, as I said earlier, the uh, automated reporting. Uh, that can be configured, that can be uh, run automatically to deliver the right reporting to, to the regulators or to feed another system that will deliver this uh, specific report. 
but also they will be able to navigate through the data for forensic investigations. And forensic investigation is an area where actually uh, every piece of data counts. You, 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 you want to know everything uh, around the parties, around uh, the transaction, the origin of the transaction is, is coming from uh, this type of uh, security settlement or trade settlement or, or just a, a regular payment. Um, because actually as you're investigating, <laughs> you want to, to be able to uh, identify signals that will help you take the right decision, a compliance related decision. So Intex will not take the decision around um, AML, for instance, but will provide the data for indeed automated processes and manual processes. So we have been working here and discussing with uh, uh, other specialized systems in the AML space that actually perform this AML um, uh, or have implemented the AML processes, but ha have the, the challenge to access the data. So this is where there is a nice fit between our uh, data accessibility function and the, the decision making that those systems uh, actually uh, implement. So, so more, more, I think, collaboration between those different uh, uh, technologies are, can be foreseen. The, 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 the key is for the bank to be able to uh, basically automate as, as much as possible and avoid compliance officers to start using Excel <laughs> and doing all linking manually because we know that leads to uh, many, uh, many operational uh, risks and, and errors, mistakes, basically. Now, um, I, I do think that as, a, as an industry, I think several years ago, banks and FIs were very much, uh, they were very much castles. Uh, to, quote, uh, to quote Ben Robinson, they had big high walls they were castles and now we're starting to see these walls come down and it'd be much more of a forest, much more of an API uh, driven ecosystem. Where do you see Clearstream sitting in this, uh, in this, in this forest, in this ecosystem? I see, I do not think that data is freely available at the end of the day. It's a financial industry, right? Uh, trust and safety of data is very important. Um, so, Within those boundaries, within those regulations that we need to adhere to, of course, there is a room to enhance uh, or create much more efficient environment internally within operations and to create more proactive reporting for the clients, some of the solutions that we can create for the clients. So I feel while there is cross-pollination that's happening, there is still a lot, a big focus on data security, safety, uh, and that overall environment. Priya, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Looking forward to seeing you face to face in the very near future. Now, I've got to say a massive thank you to our experts who have joined us on the show here today. Andre, Priya and Matt, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And also to you, our viewers. You can catch the rest of the series and much more over at ffnews.com and of course YouTube, especially LinkedIn, where you'll see me in the comments. So everyone, thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>